Uh, so hi, everybody. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming out. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here. This is now my fourth PyCon in four countries in three continents in the last year, so I'm really thrilled to be here. Huge thank you to the organizers for uh, making this happen. Uh, it's been a phenomenal conference so far. So why open source works? Uh, so I wanted to start out with sort of why did I want to give this talk? Uh, because for a lot of people I've spoken to, the answer, their answer to why does open source works is who cares? Uh, isn't it enough that it works? And it, it, it clearly works. We all use a programming language that's open source. We probably use hundreds or even thousands of modules that are open source between all of us. It, it clearly works and performs a function. But uh, I want to dive into why do I care, why it works. And so three years ago, almost to this day, uh, August 15th, 2010, I gave a talk at an education conference about open source and education. And I talked to a group of educators and researchers about some of the practices open source was using and really looking at the overlaps between techniques from pedagogy, from teaching, and practices that we've been sort of developing organically in the open source community. And a few months ago when I got approached about giving a talk here, I started thinking, what are the things I know that people might be interested in? And after having a bunch of conversations with friends who work on open source, I started to realize that a while I knew, and I sort of joined this research community, this education community, and I knew about some of their practices, and all my open source friends knew about the practices we had in open source, very few people in open source knew about the overlap between these practices. So I figured this was something worth sharing. So a bit of background about myself. How do I know about open source? Why do I care about it? I write a lot of open source. Uh, I'm one of the core developers of Django, CPython, PyPy. Uh, I'm really lucky in that my day job is now uh, to work on open source stuff for Rackspace. So I work on LibCloud and OpenStack, and you can find me in the halls and talk to me about that. Uh, I also try to help sort of shepherd open source. So I serve as a director of the Python Software Foundation, and before that, as a director of the Django Software Foundation. And perhaps most importantly, I use a lot of open source, right? Like everyone in this room. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about psychology, pedagogy, sociology. I'm not an expert in those fields to the extent I'm an expert in open source. So if I'm wrong, please let me know. Uh, I think the organizers played a very mean trick by putting me between two speakers who are actually uh, qualified to speak about some of that stuff. Uh, so hopefully they'll let me know where I'm wrong. And so we're concerned with open source, but Open source describes a lot of things, right? Open source, if you look at like the OSI's definition, is mostly about uh, OSI being the open source initiative. It's mostly about a license. What uh, rights does a person who gets your software have? They've got the right to look at some code. They've got a right to modify it, to redistribute it. Those aren't sort of practices I'm interested in talking about. So perhaps the word open source is inadequate to describe what I'm looking at. Because when I look at software that is nominally open source, it fits into sort of three categories. There are code dumps, you know. We had a legal obligation to give you this code, so here's a tarball, have fun. And that doesn't really have interesting educational practices. Then there's sort of public development. And this is, for me, projects that are, you know, largely directed by individual companies. And like, there's a public Git or SVN repo, but if you want to participate in the discussion, it's on some internal company mailing list. And so there's no community around developing the software. There might be a community of users of this software, but if you're interested in, as an individual helping develop it, you're kind of out of luck. And lastly, there's projects that I would describe as open development. And this is probably most of the things we really think about as open source. This is Python. This is Django. This is OpenStack. This is Linux. This is something where anyone can show up at the repository or the mailing list or the bug tracker and try to make a contribution and try to involve themselves and, you know, in fact, do. And so some of the practices of those communities are things like individuals contributing patches or pull requests, doing code review on something somebody submits, having a public bug tracker, helping triage bugs, helping go through all these bug reports, uh, IRC and mailing list, public discussion about developing the software, about using the software, shared timelines for, you know, when is our next release, uh, and generally sort of shared organizational practices where a group of people who aren't all at one company, aren't all on one continent, uh, don't all necessarily even speak the same language, come together and put together a piece of software. And of course, that also includes things like writing code, reviewing code, and providing support. These are sort of the practices that I'm interested in. Particularly, I'm interested in why do people volunteer so much of their free time on this? Why do employers basically give away their employees' time to work on open source software? 
because sort of very naively and intuitively, it's bonkers, right? Who lets their employees go just give away their time? What kind of person goes home and just gives away all their time on the exact same thing they do at their day job? It does not match what we see in a lot of other professions. It it's, looks like lunacy to a lot of people on the outside. So to start to answer this question, before I get into sort of what the research says, I, uh, I want to get into what the people who contribute to open source and what the people who are around open source believe. So I put together a survey, three simple questions. Do you contribute to open source? Why do you contribute to open source? Or if not, why don't you contribute to open source anymore? Or why don't you contribute as much as you like? I ended up getting about 150 responses. About 50% of contributors, uh, respondents contribute regularly. 28% have contributed in the past but don't or don't as much anymore. And 15% have not contributed, 5% other. I don't really know what other means. Uh, I had a decent sample size, 150 respondents, but the population is a little biased. It's like all people within one or two degrees of me on a social network, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and that's not like a totally normal population. Turns out I know people who are almost as strange as I am. Uh, but, so these answers are from that. They're these answers from people uh, to this survey. Uh, so the first question, why do you contribute to open source? And I've tried to sort of coalesce ones that were the same into about eight broad topics. And by, uh, far, far and away, the uh, most common answer was, I contribute because I got something out of it. Open source helped me. I want to give back. Uh, a lot of people feel like, you know, the professional lives, like I found Linux as a hobbyist, and then it turned into a sysadmin job, and then I became a programmer. I got something out of this community. This community gave me something for nothing, and I don't want it to be for nothing. I want to give back. I want to pay it forward. Uh, another really common one is to improve something I use, to, to scratch an itch I have. And you know, people use open source software. They hit a bug. They need a feature. They want to fix it, improve it, and then they want to share it with the world. If you, if you hang around the development lists for Django or Python or a lot of open source software, you've probably heard someone say something like, well, I don't have this need, but if, you, if someone else is interested in writing the software, it's probably worth you know, merging. It's, it's worth having this in Django, but it's not important enough for me to write. So I think people sort of have an intuition that scratching your own itch is how a lot of open source software happens. It's how a lot of great open source software happens. Number three reason is for fun. Uh, people have fun when they write open source. And I think a really interesting thing is people who responded for fun their answer was never, I work on open source just for fun. It was always, I have fun giving back. I have fun learning something new. Fun was sort of a modifier they used. They have fun participating in doing these other things. Another common answer, and I've grouped together two of these, even though they're pretty different. Uh, develop skills and career advancement. And people who wrote about developing skills tend to talk about things like working with you know, a really talented community, getting great code reviews and feedback, uh, get, having practice learning a new code base. Uh, in contrast, people who talked about career achievement talked about you know, the fact that open source looks great on a resume, that it was easier to find a job when you had this you know, pool of people you knew from this open community. And it's not to say one or the other is a bad thing or not a good thing. They're just different things. And I thought they were pretty interesting that people were sort of very conscious of the difference uh, between these two of these. Uh, number five answer it was to be a part of a community. Uh, people uh, in particular wrote about, you know, I'm really interested in software, I'm really interested in Python, I live in the middle of nowhere, and that's not a community I have access to. We don't have a local uh, user group. But if, if I go online, if I help contribute to Django, suddenly there's a community of people around me who sort of have similar interests that I can work with, and that's not something I have access to in real life. Another answer was to keep the world running. Open source powers nearly everything to one degree or another, and people apparently like the state of the world well enough to want to continue to make it happen. And in a certain sense, that's a variation on people wanting to give back. Uh, this also included answers like, I love knowing that you know, when I work on this patch, it's going to affect like, thousands of companies that use this software. Uh, so sort of the, the wide-ranging impact gives you. It's not just fixing something at my company. It's fixing something at 10,000 companies. Uh, eighth, Final answer, uh, because it's my job. And I, I thought this was really fantastic. Uh, I, and I'm really lucky to be one of these people for whom open source is not just a hobby, it's not just a passion, it's also my job. Companies paying people to give away software is fantastic. So sort of back to, you know, all these people want to do those things, 
And this is a question I get from friends and family a lot, right? This makes no sense. Why are you volunteering all your time giving this stuff away? Couldn't you like go sell all the software, use your time and like make some money? And I think it's sort of like a really naive economics point of view. Like, yeah, I could sell some of the software I write and some of it's actually kind of worthless. But like I value a lot of other things as well. I value being a part of this community. I value being able to give back for what I've received. And so I would say sort of like a ma the master economist perspective is there are other things that incentivize people. And so to that end, I want to look at sort of what the research says about what the practices we have that are effective at motivating people. Why do people get these benefits out of uh, open source? And uh, basically none of this research comes right out of uh, open source contribution. It's, it's a lot of more general research about motivation, about uh, learning, about teaching. And so the first thing that uh, really motivates people is mastery. The ability to gain expertise, gain skills, and really become an expert in a field. People want to be able to say, I worked at this and I became good at it. We want to understand the things we work in. It's not enough to say, I use Django for many of us. I want to understand how Django works now, and contributing to it lets me learn how Django works. And open source really rewards and encourages you to gain mastery. As you get better at stuff, uh, you get uh, you get more ability to contribute. If you learn Django well enough, you basically get asked to you know, help contribute, donate more of your free time, right? You become one of the core developers and spend even more time on it. So it rewards sort of your desire to become an expert. Uh, and it also, it lets you direct your learning at things you're interested in. I want to learn more about testing. I'm going to go find a project that's you know, really good at testing, who I can learn from. I'm going to go find a project that needs some help uh, writing unit tests to try to practice my skills. And, you know, why would, you know, experts spend so much time, you know, helping people who are trying to gain skills? Because they also care about the health of their projects, and new contributors are how projects exist. By helping someone level up their own skills, you're basically helping prepare the future maintainer, and you never really know who's going to outpace you and become a contributor who does even more work than you do and make the project better than you ever could have imagined. The number two piece is autonomy and creativity. And people want to be, sort of feel like they have a say in the direction of what they do. And no one tells you what to do in open source. It's your volunteer time, it's your free time. And you have a wide range of directions. You can participate. It's not just enough to say, I want to program. Programming is a huge field of endeavor. On any given day, I can say, I want to work on a compiler. I want to do cryptography, which is really scary. I want to work on an ORM. I want to build a website. I have choice in what I participate in, what I work on. And I direct myself to whatever I'm interested in on the day of, and I get to choose how I work on those things. When I start my own project, I get to care about the aesthetics of code in the way I want to. I get to pick the architecture of my software, and, uh, and I get to work with others because I value their knowledge and opinions. No one forces me to uh, do what any like, reviewer says, but I value their opinions, and I know that if I want my work to become a part of something, listening to their feedback is important and I get direction over how I do all this. Uh, and even further, open source gives you autonomy in that if I strongly disagree with what the maintainer says over a prolonged period of time, I can choose to stop using their software or I can choose to fork their software and let it grow in its own direction. I have complete choice over that. And finally, people are totally right when they say they want to be part of a community. The research completely backs this up. People want to be part of a community to, be have, to have this identity with this community. And I think we saw this a lot with Jacob's keynote, right? We all care about ourselves, not just as people who use the Python language, but as people who consider ourselves members of the Python community. And if you don't already, you should just know by coming to a PyCon anywhere, you're a member of the Python community. And further, we don't just want to be part of a community, we want to grow a community. We want to bring new people in. All of this creates sort of a cycle of rewards for people where I bring new people in, I see their fantastic work, and uh, to sort of, to Karen's keynote, yes, this is, seeing new kids become involved in programming is one of the most fantastic things I can imagine, because I can already start to see a new cycle of maintainers for Python and Django learning to program. It's, it's amazing how like, far out you can start to see this stuff. And also, not just see an existing big community grow, but see a new small community grow up. I, I didn't find Django when it was that early on. I found it two or three years in. But going back and watching videos of Django from the first year, it's amazing to see how it's grown 
from you know a small thing that came out of a newspaper in Kansas, the middle of nowhere, to a thing that I, I did some estimates the other day, it's probable over a billion people have access to Django-powered website. It's amazing. Just as important as the things open source does do uh, to help motivate people, to help reward their intrinsic uh, interests, is the things we don't have. Uh, the, pra the practices that other communities, other uh, endeavors have that we don't have. So the first thing is, we don't really have any extrinsic rewards for working on Django. Almost none of us get paid to work on Django. You don't get gold stars, nothing like that. Uh, the biggest reward we can give someone who participates in contributing to Django a lot is we can ask them to donate even more of their free time to contributing to Django. That's, that's the highest reward we have. Uh, and there's tons of research on the subject and basically, to be as simple as possible, for things that are intellectual, for things that are creative, for things that are not totally mechanical and rote, rewards don't motivate you. In fact, they demotivate you. And, they were, and that's because they replace your intrinsic motivation. All those things I talked about, the desire to be a part of a community, the desire to give back, the desire to learn something new, they replace that with you stop caring about those things and you start caring about the gold stars and you start caring more about the money. And then when the reward goes away, so does your interest. And so you, you actually, you care less about what you do. And this is actually sort of funny and sort of sad for me, but there's a bunch of research that shows even when you show people that rewards don't work, uh, people still tend to believe rewards will work. Like, oh, oh, it's just in that situation they don't work, but, but over here they work great. So you know, we gotta keep up, I guess, not rewarding people in a certain sense, uh, or at least rewarding them authentically, right? Thanks for contributing that patch. It helped me, uh, it helped me do this great work. You know, that reinforces the things they care about as opposed to reinforcing something else. Another thing we're sort of totally absent, and this is the flip side in many senses of autonomy, is we don't have any coercion. We sit down and we write documentation, or sorry, I, I sat down to write documentation about a security policy for Django, and we want to be able to say, uh, because this is something so important, we want to be able to give people a hard deadline. If you report a security bug, we will respond in 48 hours. How do you make a guarantee like that when it's everyone's free time? I don't know if a volunteer is going to have time when we get the email. Maybe everyone's going to be busy that week. How, how can I possibly say this definitively, even though I know it's really important? We don't have any like sticks to beat people with, right? We don't, we can't, I can't fire you from this thing you do in your volunteer time where you give away all this work. I can't fire you from that. I don't really have any carrots. We don't have like money to pay you to make sure you respond. And sort of ethical issues aside, when you're coerced, you perform worse. Uh, you don't care about the task, uh, you're demotivated, and the quality of your work is not important. And so as it turns out, we can make definitive statements like, we will respond in 48 hours, precisely because everyone is a volunteer. Precisely because we work on this because we care about the quality and we care about Django as a project. And so it's important to us that we be able to meet these standards. And we make it a priority for ourselves so we can make guarantees precisely because we have nothing which actually enforces the guarantee. And finally, we don't really have evaluative measures. We don't rank contributors. We don't give you a score. There's no, you get a B plus on Django this month. It turns out there are three major effects when you evaluate people. Evaluation becomes its own reward. You don't care about the quality of your work on Django because it's important to you. You care about it because it's important that I keep getting an A at Django. The, the evaluation becomes a reward. Second is, you care less about the underlying work. The underlying work is a means to you know, getting this positive feedback. It's not a thing that's important in its own right. And finally, you start looking for the easiest task available that gets you a good evaluation. You don't try a harder project because you might get worse feedback on it. Uh, sort of in contrast, oh, instead of evaluating, we give feedback. Here's how you can improve this patch. Here's how you're doing a great job helping out on the mailing list. And when you focus on, or if you focus on this aspect of code reviews, you'll be more effective. When we share with people what they're doing well and what they can improve, they focus on actually sustaining these practices or improving these practices as opposed to keeping up an arbitrary letter or number or anything like that. So that's sort of what, why individuals care about this. But what about companies? Right, surely they could make a lot more money and they would have fewer competitors if they just stopped giving away all their software. Right, that's like the secret stuff. That's, that's how companies work. You don't just give away all your stuff. 
But instead, we look at companies are some of the biggest drivers of open source. They do uh, an annual study of who contributes to the Linux kernel, and overwhelmingly, it's people whose job it is to work on uh, Linux. People who are paid by companies to give away their time. And in all seriousness, part of that is companies like giving back just like people do. Companies recognize that they built their business on some open source software, and if they want that, continue to con that community to be around, they should give back to it. They should continue. They should be a positive member of that community and not just someone who uses. Uh, that they can help to promote and grow the community of developers for this project. And that, that is both worth it in its own right and very, very good for their own development. Uh, to that end, companies give back, be, companies contribute to open source so they can improve, get improvements from the community and accelerate growth. When you have a large community of developers working on your software, it works so much better often than just when it's your company. And I think OpenStack is an amazing example of this. If you look at OpenStack's continuous integration servers, you'll see that on many days they process hundreds of patches and sometimes they even hit 100 patches looked at an hour. It's incredible. I, I've never worked at a company that inside had that pace of development. And yet this is, and instead this is happening from dozens of companies all contributing to this, making this happen. Uh, and lastly, companies want to grow a community. They want to be a part of community. This means things like when you hire a developer, you don't have to teach them your own special homegrown framework. You don't have to train them on new things. They come from an existing community. It gives you a pool to recruit from, and it means you can hire people who are already experts in the things you do. It, the hot new software means less time in training and more time actually uh, delivering your product. And sort of all of these go to, I think, a key point, which is that competition, cooperation are not mutually exclusive, really. They're different modes of operation, and it's possible for companies to embrace both. You know, my company, we cooperate on OpenStack, and we compete with other hosting providers. It's not a secret, it's just obvious. And neither of these things prevent the other one. And that cooperation works for some things and competition is valuable for others. Uh, so far I've been sort of really positive about all the things that are fantastic and really work about open source. Uh, but there are also challenges. And as Jacob said yesterday, challenge is another work for opportunity. It's a place we can, it's a way for us to improve. We're not perfect, we're just very good and we'll, we'll strive to always get better. And so these are some of the challenges that individuals face in contributing to open source and challenges that communities face in uh, you know, developing open source. And the first one is time and money, and it's probably no surprise. When things come a lot of out of volunteers' hours, they're grounded by sort of real life. They're grounded by, my job is really busy this week. I have a family thing. I can't contribute so much. And so this is a constant challenge. And if you think back, it's pretty obvious that money is a small clash with rewards, right? And it's not an easy one to it's not an easy challenge to handle, and a lot of communities struggle with how, what's the relationship between money and our open source software. And I think this is probably a bigger conversation that fits in this talk, and I don't have research to back this up, but my experience says that there's a fundamental difference between paying people for their free time and paying someone to make open source a full-time part of their job. I know that's been my experience. Uh, that making open source my full-time job is fantastic, but if I, w if I was just paid for sort of the stuff I was already doing in my free time, it would have the effects I talked about. It would be you know, more important to do the work that got me paid rather than you know, the work that motivated me that I was interested in. So that, I think, will always be a challenge. Another uh, large challenge is building welcoming communities. I, th I think the Python community has done a great work here over the past few years. Uh, but there's always room for improvement. We can do a better job, be more welcoming, uh, have people join our community from more diverse backgrounds, more different levels of abilities, more different perspectives. And unfortunately, one of the most common reasons people identified for not participating in open source uh, any longer from the survey was jerky maintainers. People who were not friendly to new contributors, who I guess didn't perceive that new contributors were sort of the lifeblood of open source, that new contributors were to be valued and like, helped along and so they can someday maintain your software. And so I think we want to strive to be a community where you know, every maintainer is a friendly maintainer, every project wants new contribution. And there's a lot of good reasons to care about this, but perhaps the most practical is more diverse groups, diver groups with more inputs from more backgrounds, they perform better. Groups that have more input from more people just produce better results across the board. 
Uh, another reason, and if you've watched uh, talks from last year's PyCon Canada, Jessica McKellar spoke to this, uh, is a lot of people feel like they're not able to contri contribute to open source. They don't have the skills, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the background, they don't have sort of what it takes to contribute to open source. And I'm not totally sure how we solve this, but it's important we do because almost everyone can help make open source better. I've got over 120 repositories on GitHub, and it's no exaggeration to say half of those are forks where all I did was fix a typo, just a character. And sort of when I wear my maintainer hat, I can say that there's absolutely nothing I love more than seeing a patch that's so simple that just fixes something and just makes it better, right? Now that documentation paragraph is easier to read because there's not a blatant typo in the middle of it. It's better for everyone, and it's amazing. Everyone can uh, be a part of that. So has anyone here, of a, here heard of a guy named Philo Farnsworth? So Philo Farnsworth uh, invented television in Provo, Utah, and then he did the first ever TV broadcast in San Francisco. This guy was brilliant, a visionary. He invented, he came up with the design for television when he was 15 in 1921, and then had the first operational one when he was 21 in 1927. Uh, this guy was just a visionary beyond imagination. He, he died broke. But uh, I think the guy who really impresses me is his brother-in-law, Cliff Gardner. Uh, Cliff saw Philo's drawings, and uh, he recognized that this was something important. He saw, he saw these diagrams for televisions. He thought, this is important. And so, so he went to his uh, brother-in-law and he said, I don't really understand the science. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an engineer like you are. But I can see from these diagrams that you're going to need glass tubes. How would it be if I learned to blow glass and made these glass tubes? Make a little shed out in the backyard and I'll, I'll help blow glass for you. Uh, Philo was inventing the cathode receptor, you know, the basis for a CRT. And glass tubes weren't really a thing you could buy because TV repair shops weren't a thing. This, is, this looks important and I want to help. That's what Cliff said. And that's open source. And before I continue, I should say most of that's stolen from a TV show Aaron Sorkin wrote called Sports Night. I highly recommend you watch it. And uh, Aaron, if you're listening, please don't sue me. Open source is glass tubes. Almost none of us, maybe even actually none of us, will ever create the Linux kernel. We're not probably even going to create Python. But we can all contribute in our own way. Open source is not just the creation of these great projects. We contribute to these projects because we've built hobbies, we've built our careers, we know it's important, we have fun, it helps us learn, it helps us be a part of something, and we can all learn to blow glass tubes. We can all write a patch. We can all add a documentation paragraph that's missing. We can all help fix a bug. We can all help review a patch. Every one of us can be a part of open source. And if I've convinced you there's any merit to any of this at all, uh, I'd like to encourage you to join the sprints uh, Monday and Tuesday. There are going to be a lot of people here from a lot of projects all across the Python ecosystem, and frankly, probably beyond, who want absolutely nothing more than to help enable you to get started contributing to open source. Uh, before we finish, I actually just want to quickly apologize. Original versions of this talk contain many, many more citations and statistics uh, to help support that. If you're interested in any of those, I'll have them online. Unfortunately, right now they're sitting on a pad of paper in my kitchen back in San Francisco. Uh, if you. Yeah, so thank you all for coming and listening. Thank you for all your past, present, and future contributions to open source. And I believe we've got some time for questions now. So yeah, there's a mic there and I guess a portable mic, so. So when it comes to being a maintainer for uh, open source projects, what's the best way of dealing with pull requests that are less than par without being a huge dick? Uh, <laughs> so that's a, a challenging question. And it's, I think how to code review effectively without being a jerk is an ongoing challenge for many open source projects. And I, I think the answer is, first, look at projects that do effective code review. I think the Twisted project is a really fantastic example of this. Uh, right now, they actually use almost like no technical support for this. They, they don't have inline comments, but they give really precise, useful, actionable feedback. You know, here are the list of things that I see that if you've solved these issues, this patch will be merge ready. This doesn't match our style guide. If you, you can go read the style guide here. Uh, can you add a test for this case? I think there might be a bug. I'm not sure. I don't understand this line. Can you add a comment explaining it? I, I think the most important thing is for your feedback to be actionable. Here are the items that need to happen for this patch to be ready to merge. Uh, 
All right, so I feel like most of the people who manage to contribute to open source, well, you said we need more diverse people, but I mean, you have to have a certain amount of free time and a certain amount of money and maybe someone else who earns money for you so that you don't have to earn it all the time. Do you have any thoughts on how to make it easier for other people? People who maybe don't, they have to work all day and they have to take care of the house and everything else. I mean, what can you do really? So if you have any thoughts. Yeah, so sociologists call this uh, unpaid labor. And basically, that's what open source is for a lot of us. It's unpaid labor. But it's not really what sociologists were talking about when they thought about this issue. They were talking about things like expectations of who would provide childcare or make meals or clean up the house, stuff like that. And unfortunately, I don't have a good answer. Uh, I hope someone else does. Because, I mean, it is a huge issue uh, in a lot of communities to improving the diversity of contributions. So I hope there's a good answer out there. Uh, so you talked about how rewards don't necessarily lead to, to, they replace people's intrinsic motivations, but people are looking for sort of novel ways to try to, uh, you know, pay people for some of their time, especially when they contribute a lot of things. So how do you feel about the, the Git tip model and if, there are, and if it suffers from any of those problems or if they've found a sort of a way through, through the concept of gratuity to, to sidestep some of those problems? Yeah, so Git tip, bounty source, websites like that that are trying to add sort of payments on an individual level for open source are, I think, really fascinating. And uh, I think GitTip is doing something particularly interesting in that they're not attaching rewards, you know, the monetary payments for particular things. They're sort of just attaching it to, you have a history of contributing to open source, or you have a history of contributing to open learning, or whatever it may be, here is, I, I'd like to thank you for that. Now, I think that sidesteps some of the issues but perhaps not entirely. I think websites that sort of attach bounties to particular issues present more of a challenge. There's, I, I don't have a definitive answer. There's always going to be a difficulty in resolving that relationship, right? What is the line between, you know, I'm a freelancer and if there's a big enough bounty, I can not take on a client for a week and fix this bug versus, you know, this is, I'm going to do it in my free time anyway. This is just compensation for it. That's I think a real challenge a lot of communities and individuals struggle with, and I don't think there's a good answer. I, I think it's, if we're mindful of it though, we can make it less of an issue. Being aware of this is I think an important part of that. Hi. Um, so companies are concerned that if they open source too much, then their competitors will have an advantage. Is this a valid concern? Has anyone ever open sourced themselves out of business? That's a great question. I, I have no idea if anyone's ever open sourced themselves out of business. That would be a really fascinating question to have an answer to. Uh, and yeah, I can imagine it being a challenge. If what your company does is provide an amazing technology, then if you start giving away that technology and it's as easy for me to use it on my laptop as it is to buy it from you, it's pretty intuitive to see that could be a problem for the company's business. Uh, I think part of a company being able to participate in open source effectively is knowing what that company is great at and things that aren't that are things they can open source easily. Our company is great at providing infrastructure, therefore open sourcing our billing code is you know, not a challenge for us. We're not great at billing. Billing is the thing we have to do to make money. So that's code that we can share with the community that's beneficial. Uh, our company is fantastic at support, therefore the Thing, the, our software itself is not that important. Things like that. Understanding what you're great at and making that the thing that you can focus on and making open source be things around that, things that can grow their own community is, I think, part of the key to companies navigating that. Hi, I'm just wondering, as a person, uh, or for a person who's interested in moving from a hobbyist programmer to a professional programmer uh, with a paid job, I think that um, starting an open source project of your own is a good start, but it seems like part of the skill set that employers are looking for is being able to work on a team. And for someone who's just getting involved in uh, you know, programming, contributing to something like a big project like Django is rather intimidating. So do you have any suggestions about how people can get those sort of a soft skills of working with a team of developers and the dynamics of that? Sure, that's a great question. 
I would say part of the answer is there's a range of open source projects that have teams working on them that are you know not as big and well established as Django. I think is part of the answer. Uh, I I think this is again part of where Twisted does a phenomenal job of encouraging new contributors. I, I'd highly encourage anyone who's looking for, to get their first patch into an open source project at the sprints to try a hand at contributing to Twisted. They, they really do an amazing job. And I think particularly lo looking for projects that are aware of these issues and are trying to make an impact. So the Python core development team has started a mentorship mailing list, basically for people who are interested in learning to get started contributing to Python and you know, getting, becoming a, a part of that community of developers. And so they've set up a specific mailing list to sort of give feedback uh, and have a, just a different environment for people who want to get into an existing community, that existing community. So I, I think pr basically projects that are making the effort are great places to start. All right, thank you guys very much.